Hello, mic testing, mic testing. Hello, fellow participants. A very warm welcome to all of you. Welcome to CALM, which is Cultivating and Learning About Mindfulness. My name is Wei Wen, and I will be your moderators for today. And along with me, I have my partner, my assistant moderator, which is Stephanie. Stephanie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie. I will be your assistant moderator for today. Before we start our talks today, I would like to express my gratitude to all the participants today. For your information, we have guests from Taylor's University, District College, Monash University, Hub University, Sunway University, University of Nottingham, TARC, UCSI, and fellow attendees. Thank you for your participants today. Yes, um, Stephanie, due to the COVID-19 situation and pandemic, right? Um, and even I'm living in Selangor, so my area is always actually under MCO, which is Movement Control Order. So I'm always trapped in a confined wall. Lah. So nowadays, I actually always feel stressed and maybe sometimes I'll feel a bit anxious and panic. Will it be that? True. Even though I'm now in Johor Bahru, but I feel like... Um, I was I, I was always staying in my room, so I feel like I'm sometimes very feel very anxiety, and I need someone to talk to. Yeah, so that's why we are here today because we want to hear more about what is anxiety, what is depression, and what is other like mental disorders. I would say, right. So before we start everything, before we start our talks today, I would like to firstly introduce our honorable and beloved speakers for today. Firstly. We have Dr. Anasuya, which I call her Dr. A. And um, Dr. A is the Director for Center for Excellence and Human Development. She's also the Program Director for Masters in Counseling in Tales University. And she was also a board member for numerous NGOs, NGOs and ex experience in conducting workshops. So before we start the talk by Dr. A, Dr. A, would you like to introduce yourself and show your pretty face to us? Hi, Dr. A. Hi guys. Okay, I'm uh, not so sure about pretty face, but fair enough. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, welcome, welcome to everybody here. Um, I'm going to start with the sharing screen. Can I take over the sharing screen? Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, Dr. A, before we start, right, uh, I would like to tell all the participants that um, you can see there's a QR code be beside us. Here, here's a virtual background. So, and we will also put in a link in the chat box. And if you guys want to ask any question anonymously, you can always fill in the link and we will ask Dr. A during the Q&A sessions after this lah. All right. Okay, so guys, okay. So Dr. A, pass it to you. Okay, um, I, I just realized that he asked me to introduce myself over that very boring introduction just now. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Anasuya, called Anasu, called uh, Dr. A. Uh, call pain in the neck by some people. It's all right. It's all. It's a Sunday afternoon. I don't intend to get too serious. Um, this is an interactive session. I don't think that y'all are. Uh, some of y'all are university students. Some of y'all are adults. I don't feel that you guys need a lecture at 4 p.m. on a Sunday. So I, while I am going to give y'all a little bit of you know what are the definitions or you know what is it what are some of these things mean, I do hope that y'all have questions and you ask and then we'll go from there. I've been a practicing counselor for many years. I teach counseling and I've also experienced a lot of stress, depression, anxiety, not panic attacks so much, but you know, I have experienced that myself. So maybe we can have a chat about that and you know, help each other learn about the situation a bit more. Okay. So here's the thing that people, everybody, everybody thinks that when some people say, you know, just leave me alone, I hate everyone, that they actually mean it. The problem is some people do and some people don't. There's no one shoe fits all when it comes to mental health. And that's the thing about you know, stress, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, all these things. We, we come in with this idea that if I give you, like you got a headache, I give you Panadol and it's supposed to work. If human beings were uh, as simple as that, then it would, but we are not. We are complex, we are creative, we are, entertaining, we are annoying, we are irritating, we're every single adjective on this planet. So you've got to understand that what would be when someone says, one individual says, leave me alone, I hate everyone. They may mean it. They really want you to leave them alone. Why? Because uh, I don't know, they, got some, they just had a breakup. 
they can't stand their life, whatever, or they've got, you know, they, they, they have social anxiety, different things. But there are other people that actually mean what Calvin means. They are people who want you to hug them. They want you to come towards them while they're running away. And, you know, it can lead to very interesting situations, okay? So I'm gonna just give you all some of the definitions, like what is stress? So it's an automatic response of your body to physical or mental demands placed on it. It's adrenaline is a chemical naturally produced by the body as a response to stress. You get fight or flight response. You also get freeze or friend. So when you're stressed, sometimes you can freeze, you can get very friendly, you know, you can fight or you can flight. So there are actually four Fs that you can do. Okay, um, yeah, four Fs. Huh? Mm. So you have to identify stresses, situations, anxieties, relationships that cause trauma to one's physical, emotional, or psychological stress. There you've got zits there. You know, at one point, what would stress you out is homework. Now, what is stressing him out is trying to fill in his college resume, okay, um, in order to get into a, a good college. But somehow or another, I think the father was a bit more stressed than the son when he realized that, the father realized that he didn't even know what the son was talking about, okay? So that's kind of what stresses are. Stresses can be different things to different people. In fact, the guy, you know, Jeffrey here, he doesn't look stressed. The one who actually looks stressed was the dad. And that, that's what stress is, different things for different people, okay? Uh, is all stress bad? Do you have any idea what's your, what's your uh, for a story yet? Nope, I'm waiting for inspiration. You can't just turn on creativity like a faucet. You have to be in the right mood. What is the right mood? Last minute panic. You all should know what that is. Most of you all will wait to study, will wait to do your assignments, hopefully not your group assignments, individual assignments, last minute panic. And you know, and you all find that when you do it at that point in time, your brain seems to be faster. It does seem to work. Yeah, there's a different form of stress. Okay, it's not all bad. It is called eustress. Eustress is an area that is in between your stress target zone, optimal amount of stress. So you can actually have an optimal amount of stress in your life. If you have no stress in your life, you die of boredom. It is very boring not to have any stress at all. Okay, but you have too much stress you get distressed, you burn out. When people say I'm stressed, they don't, they're not talking about, about boredom or you stress. They're actually talking about distress where they are burning out. They are, you know, they are over, over stimulated. They are, they are overwhelmed by a situation. So that's your stress. Okay. I'm, I mean, these are simple stuff. If some of y'all are from psychology, y'all should know. And by the way, shout out to people from Help and Taylor's. Okay. Two places I worked at. Thank you. Shout out to both of you. And then we've got depression. Oh, yo, depression. Yeah. For the idiots who say snap out of it. Can you all recognize that it's a joke? This is Peanuts, five cent psychiatric help. For a psychiatrist or a mental health professional that comes and tells you, you're feeling depressed, you snap out of it. Yeah, it's worth five cents or less, maybe zero cents. Given inflation, it's probably zero cents. Peanuts was a very old comic, okay? But depression is not an imaginary thing. Depression is real. It's a common, potentially serious uh, illness. Now, not everybody has major depressive disorder. The common part of it is you can have depression that is situational. That means you're in a situation, you are facing a situation in your life. Because of that situation, you are depressed. And then you can come out of that situation. I take you out of that situation you are no longer depressed. So there is a level of depression that is like for people who don't have a disorder. And then of course you have people who get major depressive disorder. And when you have that, it is same like cutting off an arm, cutting off a leg. You need to get help. You need to get treatment. You need to get medication. If you go down that line. At, at the common level of stress, of, sorry, of, uh, of depression, most of us can manage. Or well, if you can't manage, you can go for counseling and the counseling can help you manage. That negatively affect how you feel, the way you think and how you act. That's, a, that's an important thing. Depression influences how you think and act. So what you do when you're in depression sometimes may not be what is good for you and may not be what is best for you, but people tend to do it because they're not thinking in the right way, in the right frame of mind. Fortunately, it is treatable. Depression causes feelings of sadness and loss of interest in activities you once enjoyed. People, if you once enjoyed uh, going out with your friends, you don't want to go out with your friends. You once enjoyed uh, studying, you don't enjoy studying. And yes, there are some people that enjoy studying. Okay, I know they're weird, but they're there. Okay. 
No, they're very nice people. They're not weird. I'm so sorry. Don't want to trigger anybody. All right. It can lead to a variety of emotional and psychological problems and can decrease your ability to function at work or at home. Depression definitely decreases the ability to function. It makes you not as fast as you normally are. Then you have anxiety. So that's depression. Anxiety is actually worrying. The inability to stop thinking about a situation that you cannot do anything about. That is the definition of worrying. If you can do something about it, you are in planning mode. So once you have planned everything, you've done all your plans, you sit down at bed at night, there's nothing else you can do. You've done everything, you've planned everything, you're sitting down there thinking about it further. That is what you call worrying. At that point in time, there's nothing that you can do except worry. And that worry will only lead to reduced mental happiness and mental health. Worrying is the least effective activity on the planet. And if you enjoy worrying because it's your hobby, because we all have least effective activities, which are hobbies. And if you enjoy worrying and you have to worry every night, by all means, go ahead. Okay. It's your hobby. I get it. But if you really don't like worrying, then stop. Then find ways of managing your thoughts. Think of other things. Actively think of other things. Okay. So that is normal anxiety, normal worry, excessive worry. When does worrying become anxiety? Anxiety is a persistent feeling of something is wrong without cause. Worrying is I'm thinking about one thing and I'm worrying about this one thing I cannot do anything about. Anxiety is I, I, I'm worrying, but I don't know about what. Something's wrong. I don't know where. I don't know how. And it persists. So there's no identifiable cause on a day-to-day -day level as to where it's coming from. And the symptoms of it, restlessness, you're very, you're very restless, easily fatigued, cannot concentrate, irritable, muscle tension, you know, sleep disturbances, okay? So all those things occur when people are worried. And of course, you know, when you have anxiety, if you're a natural worry what, you become anxious. Or oh, oh, better still, you actually don't worry. Who worries? Your mother worries, your father worries, your sister worries. So they all come on to you like worry what's. And then you get more anxious, not because of your own problems, you know, but because of their worries. Try to avoid that because when you when you feed on other people's worry, you're just going to you know, cause yourself more drama. Okay, uncertainty feeds anxiety when we don't know what's going to happen. That's another way to feed anxiety. So like when you have got friends, like this, this is just, a, this is from Zitz, huh? and uh, the girlfriend is coming on to the guy, but the guy doesn't know exactly what is the issue. He thinks she's mad. He's not sure. She's bringing it all at once. So there are people that do that to us. When they do that to us, they're not your friends. They're not very friendly. They are very nasty. Because all that puts you in is a state of anxiety where I actually don't know what I did wrong. So what do you want me to do? So I either cannot do anything, or I, or I think I try to do everything and I mess it up. So you, you need to understand that, you know, there are certain types of relationships or behaviors with different people that can create anxiety. And this one is the most common one. When people want something of you, but they're not clear what they want. They think they're being nice by hiding it or telling it in a different way. You're not being nice, you're being a pain. If you're the kind of person who hides it and tells it different ways and all that, just try to avoid that. Be straightforward, it, it helps. Okay, can be polite also, lah. It can be diplomatic, but straightforward. Then you've got panic attack. So it's a discrete period of intense fear or discomfort. So you have a short period where, you know, you're so scared. You don't know why. You, you know, sometimes you do know why. Panic attacks, you can't know why you have a panic attack. Sometimes you don't know why. Usually it's a fight or flight response. You need to run away. The, you feel the need to run away to hide or you feel the need to freeze and you cannot move. You're like, oh, what am I supposed to do? That kind of thing. Maybe internalized, or you may display physical symptoms. There are some people in panic attack. Right? You really cannot know they're in panic attack because they're so stiff, but inside they're panicking. That's internalized. Some people will, will literally go into a corner and crouch down. Um, I've seen that. I've actually seen someone do that. Like they get, they're in such a panic attack they went to a corner and they're actually crouching down trying to hide. And everybody was like, what the heck happened? Okay, so 
panic attacks can and um I, i've had clients who like shake you know who shake and then they're like <sighs> you know so those are you can see some signs all right uh the cause of attack may not be certain or you may know some people it's like they have certain triggers people say stuff some people you're not sure what the trigger is but some things trigger them and uh so you're not sure. so panic attacks are a bit more ambiguous sometimes because it can be caused by a certain specific thing or it can be caused by anything at all you know you know people who are in, you know panic attack when they see chicha you know the 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 lizards that climb the walls in malaysia that's called called chicha just in case they're foreigners here and uh, one of the funny things about that is my friends were like so scared of those lizards those lizards have never fallen on me but somehow they always fall on them so you know sometimes it's a weird thing about fear what you fear actually comes to you Okay, think, 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 panicking, can't think, work on instinct, throw it, instinct's bad. See, that's the thing about panic attack. One of the biggest ideas of a panic attack, whether you know the reason or you don't know the reason, when we are panicking, our brain short circuits. When our brain short circuits, we tend to make bad decisions because we are working on instinct. Our instinct goes fight, flight, freeze, flee, freeze, uh, uh, freeze your friend, and generally it's freeze, it's generally it's the first three, and so you do things which you probably going to regret later okay so don't so panic can don't make decisions in a panicky state quite a bad thing to do okay so panic attacks actually can be really bad um, i mean while i while, while i was saying stuff earlier it, the effect of it can be really bad people people's hearts start pounding they feel like they're having a, a heart attack people start sweating they tremble and shake uh, they start <sighs> cannot breathe their shortness of breath they're choking pain or pain pain in the chest Uh, nausea dizziness um depersonalization they feel that you know they feel that everything is not real they feel that they're going crazy or they're losing control some people they get the fear of, of dying in that process you feel pins and needles everywhere you can get chills and hot flashes hot flashes all of this can be signs of panic attack okay so you know panic attacks can be pretty serious because if you're getting if you're driving a car and you get a panic attack you can kill yourself or you can kill somebody else So those those are things that you need to be aware of when it comes to panic attacks. Okay, so that is the definition of lung of stuff. Okay, and I'm going and that was that's as far as the as uh as uh, uh that's as far as a uh, lecture kind of formula I want to go. So my next question is, do you all have any questions on these kinds of issues? Okay. any uh, any of the audience want to questions just unmute yourself and and speak or you can type it in the chat box any questions on what panic attack is and all that guys just ask questions dr okay. a will not bite i yeah yeah okay yeah i might i might but you know no i would not you guys <laughs> all right okay um while you while you all are thinking of questions let me start off with talking a little bit about you know right now when you're talking about covid and some of the weird things i have seen in among people when it comes to stress and comes to anxiety so a lot of people who uh who used to be very like outgoing so in this time of covid they have not had many people come to visit them or come to see them and some people are in locations which are a bit remote that means that um they usually rely on grab and they rely on food panda so they are not even going shopping on their own they actually relying on food panda and grab So the other day there was a situation where we uh, four of us went over to this individual's house who has been in a remote situation and this person has been um, kind of social distancing in the extreme sense of the word so they they you know because of the lack of transport in the area so they have been just grabbing they have been just grabbing food in. so we went to visit the person was actually like wanting to hide and i'm like what you wanted company Yeah, but there's so many of you. I didn't expect so many of you to come. That was anxiety becoming a panic attack. This individual is normally a very friendly, very open, very you know, uh, very extroverted individual. But when I met them the other day, I got a shock. It took them a while to calm down. So the first initial reaction was the person actually ran up to their room, and they stayed in the room for a while. And after they stayed in the room for a while, then they're like, "Come on, it's okay." then slowly slowly they came down and this is not unique to this one individual this is right now a symptom of covid because people are 
in a state of, I'm not used to interacting. And now we're getting kids going back to school. And I think it's really needed, regardless of COVID or not COVID, regardless of the health, of the health danger, at least now we have, we know how to treat it. So the death rates are quite low. I'm actually going to say it is almost crucial that children start going back to school. Because if not, we're going to have one whole batch of children who don't know how to, to, you know, to communicate and to relate to people. Or they get into a panic state, which is not healthy. So, I mean, you know, there, there has to be a check and balance of what's going on right now. And that's one of the check and balance. Okay, so some questions. Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, Cray, okay. Can panic attack be, uh, be cured with any medication or maybe any physical training? Yes, there is actually medication for panic attacks. Like uh, when you see a panic attack coming, and some of y'all may know some of it, like Valium, you know, relaxations, relax, uh, relaxants do help doing panic attack. Are they the best way to deal with panic attack? No, they're not. Can they, can they be controlled by behavior therapy? Yes, they can. And in fact, that's what I've done. I, I do it with clients quite often. Uh, you teach a client to notice when you're going to get a panic attack. Usually a panic attack doesn't come from nowhere. It feels like it comes from nowhere. The first few times you experience a panic attack, it does feel like it's coming from nowhere. But there's actually a buildup. There are actual symptoms or indicators that lead to the panic attack. Sometimes those symptoms can be very fast. It can be like in three minutes or four, or four minutes, like quite fast. But sometimes it can be like, you know, over half an hour where you're building up symptoms. So what you need to do is you need to first identify the symptoms. And then if you can identify and short circuit it before it becomes a panic attack, obviously better. So if, if the places that trigger you are certain kinds of people or certain topics, then you recognize a topic and you start preparing yourself to not go into a panic attack state. Another one is control your eyes. If you find that I'm going into a panic attack state, or you find that you have a friend or a family member that is, you know, that is at the beginning of a panic attack state, what we tend to do is, oh my God, you're going to attack, you're going into a panic attack, let's go. So you're going to create more of a panic attack. Don't do that. You see that word behind, you see the word behind all the speakers? Although, although mine is upside down for some reason, but you know, for the other speakers who have done it properly, I did it wrongly, don't ask me why I did it wrongly. The word C-A-L-M there, keep calm. The first thing you got to do when somebody is in panic attack, keep calm. Then what you can do, this is, a, this, is a, this is an easy way, is that people always tell you to breathe. Here's the, here's the trick about breathing. If you do this, you can actually become more anxious. You know, people go, okay, breathe some, breathe some. Deep breath, deep breath. You actually become more anxious. What you need to do in order to use breathing to calm yourself down is hold your breath. Breathe in, hold, and breathe out. The whole point is when you're actually calming down. If you do it immediately and fast, you're not going to calm down. Another one, another trick is if you're with somebody and that person is going into a panic attack and you're noticing it, ask the person to follow your fingers. From one side, keep your eye on my finger and follow my finger, slow down and take a breathe while you're following my finger. Keep looking at my finger. I know you're panicking. It's okay. You don't have to worry. Just look at my finger. Slowly move your finger across their eyes and ask them to follow and breathe. So these are, you know, sh techniques that somebody else can help to short circuit panic attack. Tell them to look at the finger and just move slowly. Don't move too fast and tell them to breathe. Okay. So that in that way, you can short circuit a panic attack. All right. One of the things about panic attack is noticing that it's coming and keeping calm. And when you do that, you can actually avoid it. And there are clients who have avoided it. Of course, you can't avoid it all the time. When I do this activity, it means that out of uh, five times you're gonna get a panic attack, four times you short circuit it, one time you won't. Most people understand that that's part of learning how to use it. Some people, oh my God, you know, I had four times I stopped it, then the fifth time, what's wrong with me? Am I getting worse? You know what I said about anxiety and worrying unnecessarily? Yeah, that's what that is. I can see why that person has got panic attack. Because, you know, you know, it's like you enjoy worrying and you can't see it as a process where you're getting better. Calm down. Chill. Okay, life's not that straightforward. We're all going to get times when we are either panicked, anxious, 
you know, uh, all these type of things. Um, biggest thing to do is trust yourself to keep calm. And if you can do that, you got half the battle done. Okay. Um, so that's about panic attack. What if we come across someone who's having, yeah. Okay. So what I said just now, if they're already in a panic attack state, you just stay with them. If they are already in a panic, in a, in a complete advanced panic attack state, all you can do is stay with them and just keep calm yourself. Do not panic yourself. Take them out of the situation. If they are standing up, get them, try to get them to sit down. If they are sitting down and panicking, they're still panicking, maybe they need to lie down. Okay? They, you know, there are slow activities to keep them. A glass of water. Uh, try not to go cold water. Don't go hot water because they might pour it on themselves. Try to get like warm water, room temperature water to drink. That will also help if people are panicking. Okay? Hold hands. If they're shaking, hold hands. Keep it warm. Just the palms. You don't have to do more than that. Be careful about putting your arms around people unless you know them very well. Because if they're in a panic state, or even though they're your friend, you're in a panic state, you put your arm around them, they can, in their brain, think that you're catching them. So be careful about what you're doing. Always make sure that, you know, you have a, you, you, you give people their space because they may, they, how they perceive space may be different from how you perceive space, okay? Uh, there is a QR code for anonymous, uh, anonymous questions, okay? Do people with depression know they have depression? Interesting question. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. There's not everybody, not everybody who gets depression recognizes it. A lot of people are, you know, can have depression and can just be doing stuff because they need to get things done. So they don't focus on depression and they just do stuff. Okay. But then at night, you know, they're having issues at night. They can't sleep when they're by themselves. They don't like themselves so much. They can't sleep so much. They can't do stuff. So an example of somebody who probably, um, you know, uh, you know, they knew they had depression, but you know how to handle it. I like Robin Williams and all that. You know, we, we all know that he had major depressive disorder. He had the disorder and he couldn't, he couldn't manage the disorder. Uh, but a lot of people didn't know that he had it. A lot of outsiders, uh, the inside people knew. And um, for the most part, when it comes to depression, if from our behavior, if we are in a, in a mental state, to observe our own behavior, we know we are depressed. Because the things that we want to do, we are not doing. But if you are, if you are coming from a mindset where, oh, you know, um, this kind of people cannot get depression. Poor people cannot get depression. Uh, rich people cannot get depression. And so you think that because you're a certain category of people, you cannot get depression. Then even though you are experiencing depression, you don't want to admit to it. You don't want to look at it. The worst still are parents who don't want to admit their kids have depression. So they will tell a child who's got depression or a teenager who's got depression, you don't have depression. And because it's your parents talking, you know, kids tend to believe. And then they think, no, I don't have depression. Why my parents said so? Yes, maybe your parents need a bit of help as well in parenting because there's no parenting course. People are not born expert parents. People are just, you know, people are just born, okay? So that's also one of those things about depression. So it's very hard to see. When it comes down to managing, I know, I know the question is not here, but I'm going, to, I'm going to open some of the other topics that come with when you're talking about anxiety, depression, and all these type of things. One of the ways that people have of coping that is not a positive coping mechanism, but it is coping, is cutting. Now, or oh self-harm. Now, some of, the, some of y'all may have friends, you yourself may have self-harm before, okay? My self-harm is, I don't like cutting, I don't like blood, I don't like my own blood, okay? I'm not scared of it, but I just don't like it. Is I used to bang the wall, I used to slam my fist against the wall, okay? When I was a teenager, but quite hard. To the point where right now, if I hit the wall, I don't really feel pain, because it's a bit, you know, I know how to hit the wall already. So the, the thing about it is, what is then self-harm? Are people who are, who are self-harming suicidal? No, they're not. People who are self-harming are not necessarily suicidal. In fact, for some people, it's the opposite. In, by self-harming, they are keeping themselves alive. They are managing the pain. Self-harm for a lot of, for, for a huge group of people, I won't say all, 
a huge group of people who are you know, in self-harm behavior, what they're doing is the pain inside here, the pain inside here, it's stuck. I cannot get it out. It's overwhelming. I cannot control it. So you know what I'm going to do? This pain I can control. This pain I can manage. This pain I am in charge of. So when I cut myself, when I hurt myself, somehow this pain is reduced and I feel better. So it is not they want to kill themselves. It is they want to help themselves. And the only way they know how to help themselves is to give themselves more pain. These are people who have experienced issues from childhood, who have experienced issues in their teenage years that are quite hard and quite painful. And when they are in pain, the only way that they know how to manage their pain is to hurt themselves even more. And that's because we don't teach enough ways of coping with pain. We don't teach children how to manage pain. And that's a sad thing. So don't mix up the two. Yes, sometimes people who are suicidal could have self-harm. But self-harming in itself does not mean they want to kill themselves. It just means they want the pain to stop. They want to manage the pain. They want to at least be in charge of the pain. Okay? I, and I, I know that you all didn't ask a question, but since the questions were slow, I thought I'd ask it, I'd answer that first anyway. Okay, so uh, can can someone overcome overthinking as, as if they hear voices in their heads? Okay, if you're thinking too much, you're overthinking. One of the things that it does, it does require practice, okay? Um, most of you all know mindfulness meditation helps people with overthinking. When, when you use mindfulness or meditation, that is one of those known kind of ways. Uh, focusing on martial arts, focusing on exercise helps people stop overthinking. Here's what I used to do when I was a kid, because I never liked exercising. Uh, meditation, not so much. You know, I'm not so much meditation exercise. So, you know, uh, I used to tell myself stories. When it's sleeping time, I can't sleep I'm thinking. So what I used to do is I used to tell myself very long, elaborate, complicated stories. You're not talking about stories that are like, you know, simple, simple stuff. You're talking about totally, you know, pretty out there kind of stories, which led me to writing fan fiction and all that. When I was an adult, mind you, but because when I was a teenager, we didn't have fan fiction. I'm that old. So I actually wrote fan fiction and all that, which was kind of some of the expressions of those stories. And I did it so much that now when I'm like thinking about work and all that at night, I can't, do it, I can't think about it. I just start telling myself a story and I can go to sleep. Okay, for some of y'all who are very religious, you can try saying prayers at night just before you go to sleep. Bore yourself with prayers and go to sleep. Sounds, sounds like it works to me. Um, I mean, there are people who actually do things like count sheep and all that, but that's what they're doing. You're taking yourself, your brain, and you're being in charge of your brain. The more you are in charge of your brain, the more you control worry. All right, if, as long as you recognize what it is. Now, if you're hearing voices in your head, then um, that's a whole different subject altogether. It doesn't mean people are crazy. It, it just means that sometimes some are memories, some are memories on repeat, and you need to short circuit those memories or get them out of your head. Okay, so it can be flashbacks as well. So these are these are issues that have to be dealt with in a different manner. I'm not gonna go into too deep now because you know, that's a very specific question. Okay, um, awareness of mental health has increased drastically over, okay, I have to reuse this, over the years, but there's little focus on how to overcome it. What do you think? Uh, they are focused on how to overcome it, but unfortunately, it is not known by everybody, and there is not enough. They, people are very taken up, and people really want to talk about the symptoms because that's where the sexy part is, you know. Or the the big part is when people have a breakdown, but how to manage the breakdown that comes after that? Not so sexy. It's not newsworthy for most people. So the the what I think is that the dialogue of healing has to be a little bit more obvious, has to be a little bit more overt, and not just a list of things that look like, oh, why don't you just do this one thing to cure yourself? That is what annoys me in all the, you know, uh, how do people overcome it? You have this one or two things. Human beings are not one or two things. We are many things. 
And when you only give people one or two things and you say, oh, I tried those things, nothing works. Then you go, nothing works. And it gets worse because you don't know how to manage and nobody told you it's just one or two things that may not work for you. It works for some people. And this includes medication. Okay? So that is the part of, uh, that is the part of mental health awareness that needs to be out there. That some doctors, some psychologists won't work for you. Some, you will not like this certain counselor or psychologist, go to a different counselor, go shopping, don't worry about it. Certain people don't ngam. They tak ngam, tak ngam Okay, so, sorry, sorry, just in case they are foreigners here, those who, if you don't gel together, if you don't work together, then you don't work together, all right? So then you have to try something else. How do you help our, our, our friends and families who are aware of their mental instability, but they themselves don't know how to cope or cure it? Get them to a therapist. Do not try to cure them yourself. I can't counsel my father. I cannot counsel my family members. Unless I want to go crazy, then I can do that. If I try to counsel, to, 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 to give counseling to my family members, you're going to end up with two people depressed, not one person. Not that person. That person and me are going to be depressed. In fact, I'll probably end up more anxious than that person. But the reality is you cannot counsel your family members. If they are aware they have a problem, what you need to do is you need to go with them to a therapist. It can be a counselor, clinical, or a, a psychiatric, depending on the intensity of the problem. Okay? If you want to help them, go with them the first time. Sit with them. But don't try to do it yourself. If not, you are going to end up... Okay, and this is including if you are a professional. Huh? This is not just if you are a first-timer. Even if you are a professional, okay, one of the best ways to give yourself depression, anxiety, and stress is try to counsel your family. Totally don't do it. Totally don't do it. Okay. Uh, is self-harm considered gentle speaking? Seeking? No, it's not. Most people who self-harm don't even tell you they're self-harming. Most people who self-harm do it very privately. And then some people who have worked their way through that self-harm are actually willing to show it in public. They're not attention seeking. They are seeking cure. In my point of view, now I'm going to put the joinder there because I'm sure there are one or two people out there who are attention seeking. I'm sure. In the whole world, there's no extreme. If, you know, it's everybody, most people are not. You may have a small minority that are, but they are a minority. For the most part, you know, when it comes down to self-harm, what they're seeking is a cure. And sometimes they show the, they show the signs of, of self-harm. Um, for some, it can actually be in the hope that somebody will recognize them. Somebody will recognize that they are human beings who've been through a lot of pain. Somebody will recognize that they have been through a lot and respect them for who they are. A human being who has experienced a lot. For teenagers especially, they don't get enough of this. They don't get enough of this type of respect. Because, you know, you're very young, you don't understand pain. You're very young, you just follow what we say. The world doesn't work like that. Right? That's not real. That's not, you know, young people are human beings as well who also experience pain equally, if not worse than some adults. Because adults have more resources to manage their pain. But teenagers have limited resources. Children have even more limited resources. So if you're not supporting, it can go wrong very easily. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, what is it? So that's attention seeking. Can meditation help as well to overcome stress and anxiety? Very short answer. Very easy answer. Yes, it can. Meditation is you controlling your mind. So if you can control your mind, it can help you with stress and anxiety. Um, uh, okay. Uh, what about a child below 12 years old having a panic attack, depression, anxiety? How can you handle? Oh, wow. Okay. When you have 12 year olds experiencing stress, anxiety, panic attack and depression, anxiety, I want to see the parents. Parenting is not matching the child. If a child under 12 has panic attacks, depression and anxiety, first thing I'm going to ask and first thing I'm going to wonder about is what the hell, how is the child being punished? Has there been abuse going on? And it may not be the parents doing it. Is their brother, cousin, auntie, 
you know, a babysitter, a tutor, whatever, has something gone terribly wrong in this child's life. Because children don't know how to express sometimes, so they internalize everything. They blame themselves when they are abused, you know, by family members. Because, you know, my family member is a good person. So for them to do this type of thing to me, it means I'm a bad person. So they internalize it. And from internalizing it, you get panic attack, stress, you get all those things. So if you have a case of somebody under 12 with this situation, my first one is I need to know what's happening in that family. And I'm not saying that the parents are the ones doing it. I'm saying that there's a good chance the parents have allowed somebody to, to you know, some, something to go wrong in that family. I'm going to put in those terms, okay? I don't want to trigger anybody by using other terms. But if you're all okay with it, and if you're all more interactive, then I know whether you're being triggered or not. But you're all very silent. I'm glad that you all are typing. But you, know, you can always unmute and ask questions. You know, feel free, okay? Um, so sometimes our friends text us randomly saying how hard their life is. It's been pretty rough and not easy to carry out the daily routine. What kind of reply should we give? Okay, so when friends text you randomly, it really depends on your state of mind. You have to understand that um, when when you are when you are when you are um, when people are texting you, your phone can become your weapon. It can become the, the cause of your mental mental of your anxiety and stress. Certain people we can support to an extent. And then we have to say, you need to get help because I can't do this anymore without me getting sick. You need to self-care and understand your boundaries. If you want to help your friend and your friend and your friend comes and texts you once or twice, so you've gone and you've talked to them for one hour, one hour, two hours, two hours, and then they go back to doing the exact same thing. So what they're using you for is that they have gone and spilled all the water or they've spilled all the stuff. They're, they're bringing you there as a sponge to sponge up all the nonsense. And then after that, you are carrying, now you are heavy, you are overweight, you're this one. And then they go and pour some more water. They're not dealing with that situation. They're still allowing the water to pour. So you have to realize that you are not, you are human beings and you are equally as important as your friends. And if somebody who you have spent time with and you've given them time, comes and says, how can you do this to me? I'm in pain. The question back would be, how can you do this to me? I've already told you there's only so much I can do before I get sick. So are you telling me you want me to get sick as well? Can I take you to somebody who gets paid and can help you? Don't say, I can't talk to you. What you say is, these are numbers you can call. These are people you can go to. These are people who are paid, who are, you know, there are, are places that have therapy for free. All your universities, I know that I know of, all the universities that were mentioned just now, have counselors. Take them to the counselor, tell them to go and see the counselors and talk to the counselors when they're overwhelmed. Because no point two people being sick. I'm gonna repeat that over and over again, okay? One of the most important things of dealing with mental health is ensuring that you are calm, you are healthy, your brain is in the right place. Because if your brain is in the wrong place, then who's going to help anybody? I want to help everybody. I cannot help anybody because now I'm burned out. Please don't do that. It's not a good, it's not good for you. It's not good for your friends. It's not good for your family. Okay. Uh, so I've given you what kind of reply you can give. Uh, I know I'm actually going to say it, it depends on you. It doesn't depend on the individual. One of those biggest mistakes we make sometimes is, oh, you are, you're not a therapist. You're not the therapist. You're their friend. As a friend, how much can you take before it becomes too much? And you can have a conversation with them when they're not down about it. And say, look, okay, this is what I can do. I'm still your friend. I am there. But sometimes I can't manage. So if I can't manage, that means I won't answer the phone. That's one of the things I have learned over the years. My phone is for my convenience, not yours. So if anybody is calling me or texting me, and I tell this to clients all the time, I will answer in 24 hours or 24 working hours if it's for university students and university staff. 
I will answer on a working 24 hours. If it's my friends or it's my clients, I do say 24 hours, but I won't answer immediately. And the reason is because I can be doing a lot of other things and I am doing other things. And I don't want to give the impression that I'm free, so free, I'll be there 100%. Yeah, I am there when I can respond because there are other things that I'm doing at the same time. So me being available does not mean I'm available 24 seven. I'm not 7-Eleven, I'm a human being. I'm one person and I can only, I as one person can only manage so much. So you sit down and talk to your friends like that. And you know, if they are your friend, they will understand. If they're not your friend and they are leech and they are user, they won't understand, okay? And I know people who have major, they need other people. They have got major issues in their life. And the good ones will tell you, if it's okay, sometimes you don't answer the phone, it's fine. It's just that sometimes you answer the phone, I appreciate it. So have that conversation, all right? Um, no, okay. there are no comments. Uh, we, have, we have others questions. Yeah. Um, I'll help them to read it out. Okay. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, that's the questions. Uh, it's interesting. Like, um, a child has been uh, caned by the teacher, but the child was just a slow learner. So trauma till the child grow up as it lead to have issues with um, decision making. So is that part of anxiety? That's trauma. That's trauma. That's not even anxiety. That's worse. That's trauma. Because what has happened there is that a child is a slow learner and you're caning the child. So what you're teaching the child is that the way they learn or they are wrong and they are wrong to the point that they can be punished. So a child who is trying their best and then you are caned for trying your best, you know, it, it, just, it just makes you feel wrong. That's not the way to educate. And later when, uh, Ms. Ra when uh, Raji does psychoeducational, maybe she can talk about better ways of educating. But that is trauma. You know, caning, caning somebody who is trying to learn, who's a slow learner, is not the way to help them. You can't, it actually is trauma. It's not, you know, the, the person has been traumatized. They have been taught that they are not enough. And that is something which is actually beyond anxiety, beyond, you know, beyond this, the, the, the normal, what I said just now. Those, that is actually going, going down the line of requiring intervention. Okay, and requiring very gentle intervention and support. Okay? All right. There's another question um, stating that um, if someone is under a noise situation, especially like children cry and shout for something, but she or he will feel tension with that. Is it something wrong? No, that's normal. When you have persistent irritations, like crying, 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 or you know, you, your anxiety goes up, especially babies, baby crying, for a human being, the sound of a baby crying naturally makes us anxious because we are, you know, the, the instinctively, we know something is wrong, a baby is crying. So to be able to ignore a baby crying is very difficult because we are, we are human beings and we are not built to ignore that kind of voice. That's why the baby's voice is in a way grating on the ear. It's very high pitched, it's screechy. It's, it's order, it is in order for us to try to stop the noise to go and look at what's wrong with the child, to stop the child from crying. Uh, hopefully, you know, in a positive way, like not stop the child from crying in a negative way. But uh, it is very normal for us to get upset by that. If you are studying, why do you think when you study, you do exams, everybody says you must be quiet? Because, you know, when if, if they were doing a jackhammer outside when you're studying, although it may not be so close, it may be next door, it actually interferes with your ability to concentrate because your brain is also thinking about that noise. So yes, it is very easy for us to get anxious from noise. Keeping in mind that noise, music can also soothe us. If you're upset, most of us listen to music. Most of us can, when, when we are feeling really sad or we're feeling depressed, we switch on music, we listen to it, we calm down. Or, you know, we go into emo state and we enjoy the music. I mean, come on, we all have done it, right? So we go, we, we have these different states where Music, noise, you know, inflow into the brain definitely it definitely has an impact on your emotional state. Okay? I hope that answered the question. Okay, next question. Any other questions? Yes. Um, 
Oh my god, I can't believe it's already one hour with Dr. A. Okay, maybe we'll start. Last question, last two questions, okay. Yeah, all right, maybe we'll end this question with, with this question. How does anxiety and panic attack grow over time? Does it come from childhood most of the time or it can grow any time of our age? Okay, it can come from childhood if you have experiences in childhood that are negative. The question is that any of us, like right now, the, the person I was talking to about when in, in the beginning of the of, of the talk, I talked about somebody who from COVID suddenly now is panicking, like you know, very anxious about meeting people. He, the person didn't have it before now. They were free of it before now. So what it means is that at any point in time, depending on a situation, you can develop panic attack, anxiety, depression, stress, and all that. It is not something that only develops in your childhood. In fact, sometimes in childhood, many people just don't develop it in childhood because they manage to go through the childhood, you know, all the kinds of traumas that they have without even noticing. And then sometimes it develops in teenage years. But um, basically, it depends on the trauma that you're going through or the situations that you're going through in your life. When you have death, when you have loss, when you have got, ter- when you've got bad things happening, that's when you develop these types of issues. If generally, if you don't have, you know, traumatic things happening, then you're fine. So then you can move forward, All right? Okay. So go on for the next one. Next question. Oh, Raji is giving us a bit more time. So any more questions? Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Mr. Raji. Um, there's one more question. How That's to not- help? Yeah. Uh, it's like how to help depressed people who choose to not believe they have depression. They may be reluctant to get a treatment. How to help these people, like to comfort them to a therapy or a counselor? Well, okay. If you want to be there for people who are depressed but don't want to admit their depression, then just be their friend. Mm. Like any other, like any other human being, just be there when you can and say, "Look, I'm here. Want to go out? Okay. You don't want to go out? That's fine." You know, just go with, I'm here when you want to talk about it. If not, I can just support you quietly. I invite you to go out. You say yes, we go out. You say no, we don't go out. Right? It's simple as that. Um, the, the danger of, the, danger of um, the friends with depression is if the depression is affecting everybody else. So they don't want to get help for their depression, but they want everybody to help them. So these are people who, I, I hate to say this one, but these are people who will end up using people around them, consciously or unconsciously. Because you don't want to admit that you've got help. You need help, professional help, or you need serious help. You don't want to admit that you've got a problem. But you expect people to kind of change their lives to support you so that you can manage better. Because, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. It must be everybody else who's got a problem, right? And then, they, then th- that's a very dangerous category of individuals. So they make life very difficult for other people because they always play the victim. Ah, that one I didn't talk about. And maybe I want to spend a little bit of time explaining this. People who play the victim, whatever goes on in their life, they are always the victim. Although, when we think back about what happened, they did it to themselves, or worse, they did it to us. They did stuff that hurt us. They did stuff that, was, that, made, that made it hard for us to help. You know, they asked us, they, they, we helped. We actually went and helped them and did things for them. And still, it was not enough for them. It's never enough for them. You give them five. You give them five dollars. They want ten dollars. You give them five hundred dollars. They want five thousand dollars. For people who play the victim, they are never in the wrong. You are always in the wrong. And one of the famous things is, oh, so it's my fault. Everything is my fault. People who say that don't believe it's their fault at all. In fact, by saying that, by taking a blanket statement like that, and you're like, no, not everything is your fault, but this you did wrong. What do you mean this I did wrong? You know, they, 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 they twist what you're saying to such an exaggeration that they make you feel guilty. You know, you, 
I know I'm pointing out one thing. I didn't say that, but you are now on the defensive because they have gone on attack and they're very good at doing it. People who play the victim actually victimize you, actually make you feel responsible for the problems in their lives, make you feel responsible for all the fights. And they are also abusers. So in this talk, I didn't go because nobody asked about abuse. I didn't go down that line because it's a question and answer thing. But, you know, just because I'm, I'm thinking of this, if anybody is in a relationship where somebody plays the victim all the time and makes you feel emotionally guilty, keep in mind, eh, that's the first step one of abuse. That's step one of a seriously abusive relationship. If you all find with your partner that you are the one saying sorry all the time, and when they say sorry, the way they say sorry is, I'm sorry you are, you don't understand where I'm coming from. I'm sorry you cannot understand my feelings. I'm sorry that you're, you come from a very childish background. You see, the I'm sorry, the I'm sorry is, the, you know, it's pity, not for you. They're trying to like pity you and put you down. That type of, please, if you're in relationships like that, the person does not love you. I hate to be the one to say it. The person is using you and the person is potentially an abuser. So keep in mind, okay? There's a huge red flag. Yeah, somebody said red flag. Yeah, can relate based on past experience. Yeah. Uh, I used to have a friend who said he had a bipolar disorder. I always believed what he said. And then he was, he would always say he's wrong in the end when something happens. Is he playing the victim card? Uh, okay, firstly, my question would be, how was he diagnosed and how is he being treated with bipolar disorder? See, a lot of people say they've got bipolar, but when you actually ask them how were they diagnosed and what treatment are they experiencing? Oh, I got no treatment. Yeah, I thought so. So he's self-treated. Yeah, if you go and read about bipolar disorder and self-treatment, oh shit, online, even better. Okay, number one, I doubt he's got bipolar. Uh, um, this one is where I'm going to go. Yeah, he's playing victim. Yeah, he's playing victim. Okay, uh, when, when you self-diagnose, there's something wrong with your, 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 your psychiatrist. Okay, can you, can, can you see the, 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 mental, the mental, the mental drama going on here? You self-diagnose from the internet. So you are saying, so, uh, so somebody with bipolar is saying you have bipolar. Would you really, so somebody who's, you know, not all mentally there is telling you, you are not all mentally there and you're accepting that. Yeah, would you, would you go with that? I wouldn't. Okay, so please, huh? Yeah, the, yeah. I'm just gonna say out and out that person is uh, really playing the victim, not dealing with the problem, running away from the problem, and using their problem as a way to get get what they want. So you know, uh, tell the person to please go and get a proper diagnosis, and if they have it, then get treatment for it, which is even better. Because you know, there are lots of people out there who get all these sicknesses, and then they don't get treated for it. And then what do you want? I mean, that's when they actually want, that's when they are looking for a bit of attention, right? Okay, any other questions? I think that it's all, Dr. A. Okay, that's wonderful. Okay, I'm glad that you all have, uh, you all, uh, some doctors do ask to self-diagnose and then find some website that, really, some doctors ask you to self-diagnose? I'd like to know those doctors' names so I cannot, I cannot encourage anybody to go and see them. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I'm, uh, what? Some, no, I mean, once they diagnose it, then they can ask you to go and read about it or learn about it on the internet. That part I get. But for, for a doctor, for a clinical psychologist or a psychologist or counselor to go and tell a client to self-diagnose, then why the heck did they study clinical psychology and, and counseling? And, you know, why have masters for those type of courses? Okay. So seriously, can I please know the name of this doctor who self-diagnosed? Because I really don't want to, I want to make sure I don't accidentally rec recommend them to somebody because um, I, I, if they don't trust their own capability to self-diagnose and they think it's so easy, then obviously they shouldn't be doing that job, man. Scary. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. Okay. All um, right. Okay, guys. I, I'm happy that uh, we went we went to the one hour. So exactly on the one hour. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, maybe she's in a bad mood and she says something like that. Uh, yeah, then maybe she needs to get some, you know, some self-care, 
and she needs to de-stress de herself because she's got stress, anxiety. Remember what you said? They, when they have got anxiety you, uh, or you are in panic attack, you don't make good decisions. It affects how you think. So yeah, you're right. Maybe that person is, was that day had a very negative day, had a very bad day and is not thinking straight. Um, and if you're not thinking straight, you possibly shouldn't be seeing clients. Yeah. Right? Seriously. Okay? If you can't think straight and you can't manage your own thoughts, you shouldn't be seeing clients. That's my opinion. Okay. Anyway, that's all my opinion. I'm going to um, apologize. Miss, uh, doc, Dr. Anasuya, uh, can I ask one last question? Hi, I'm Tarisha. Sure. Hi, Tarisha. Again. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for uh, actually, having being brave enough to open and talk on the Yeah, because you wanted someone to speak and then I'll speak out. Because uh, your last few words uh, made me think of this question. Uh, the one where the doctor was in a bad mood and then she, she or he or she would have probably said the wrong thing. Uh, can I ask on like your... Is it true that some psychiatrists, they need their own psychiatrists too? Yes. Fast answer. Very easy answer, yes. If people don't know how to self-care, this includes psychiatrists. You know, if, you, if you're coming from a, a position that I know everything because I got a medical doctor, now I've gone and studied psychiatry and I'm suddenly very good at it. So I don't need, I never need self-care. I don't need to look after myself. And then they're seeing clients. You know, you, you think of it, uh, every day you're hearing stories which are terrible. Every day you're seeing the worst of humanity. So in your mind, you can go, well, if they are so bad, obviously I can't be that bad. No matter what I'm doing, it's not as bad as what my clients have done. So some people hide behind that, you know, they, they, they've gotten so, um, it's called burnout. They've gotten, they've gotten burnout and they've, got, they've gotten, what's it called? Compassion fatigue. And they don't recognize that they have compassion fatigue. So if you don't recognize that you have compassion fatigue and you're dealing with clients, and this has happened a lot, by the way, where, where the therapists don't recognize they've got compassion fatigue, then they actually can hurt the client. Their words can be very sharp. They can be very extreme. They can be very demanding of the client or pushing the client to go into areas where the client is not ready to go because they've burnt out on their compassion. They, 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 and they're not self, they're not taking care of themselves enough to manage that situation. So yeah, I'm actually going to say a lot of I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to deny that that is actually true. I have I do go and I have gone for therapy. I do go for therapy. Why do I go for therapy? Because I know therapy works. I mean, and I know that you know I can't handle every single issue in my life without some support. You know, I you know I can, but you know that's so hard. You know why should I, why should I be so hard and you know handle things so hard? I do go for that. One of the biggest uh, ther the therapies I went, I actually went to Canada to do it. I did the intensive therapy, not, not as a trainer, but as a client. I, I paid for an intensive course after MH370. About in, uh, actually during the time when MH17 went down, so it's terrible. I was in Canada experiencing counseling. I went for a conference. So, but after that, I took some time and I went to, and I went to a farm. And they had this uh, very intense counseling counseling sessions on the farm. And I went for that because I needed it after MH370. And then when MH17, I was like, there's no stress. But, you know, it was a time for healing for myself. And I've done that. I've done other things as well to help in my healing and to make sure that I am grounded and I self-care and take care of myself. Um, you know, and the day-to-day -day one is my dog, my pets. So, my, you know, my pets are part of my self-care routine. So you have a routine for self-care that helps you. But if you don't have it, it is very easy for you, for, for me to 100% agree with you that, yep, some psychiatrists need psychiatric help themselves. Counselors as well, clinical psychologists as well. Okay? That, thank you for that question. Yes. Thank you so much, it. Dr. A. I appreciate all your answers. You're welcome. Okay, guys, I shall, I shall give the floor to Raji and uh, Ms. Raji, Raji Lakshmi. And uh, thank you for letting me go over time a little bit, Ms. Raji. Thank you. All right. Uh, maybe before Ms. Raji start, um, so I will thank once again Dr. A for attending our sessions today. And I totally agree with what Dr. A said just now, like depression, anxiety, and also panic attack, panic attack would definitely influence how we act and how we think. So we should manage it well. And what Dr. A said just now, how we should manage is stay calm, which is our main topic for our sessions today. So once again, thank you, Dr. A. And before Dr. A believe, 
we will actually request for a photo session with our beloved Dr. A and also Miss Reggie. So guys, please, please, please open your camera and then show your pretty and handsome faces to all of us. And we... Hi, Miss Reggie! All right, I will, I will introduce Hi, Reggie. How are you? Good, yeah. good. Okay, so guys, let's open the camera and then we will have... How yeah, serious are we supposed to be? Yeah, hi, Jinming. Hi, hi, Yili. Okay, come guys, let's open camera and we'll take a photo. Alright. Hello. Hi, Kei. See all those pretty and handsome faces. Oh my god. Yeah, right, right, right now I'll see her photographs. Yeah, hey, Chandra. Nice to see you. Yeah. Hi, Dr. A. Yeah. Good to see you. Hi, hey. Jasper. Alright. Alright, okay. See who I recognize. I will take pictures from my side. So all right. It might take two pictures. Okay. So the first picture is... So few of you got camera. Come on. La. <laughs> Second page. Okay, let me check the pictures. So complicated the picture is. Oh, everyone is pretty. Just so cool. where are you that you need to wear a mask? <laughs> Uh, I'm in a car. Oh, you're in a car. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, guys, wear mask, wear mask. <laughs> yeah, must wear mask. If you're outside, then you must wear mask. I was just curious. Yes, okay. Okay, yeah, Stephanie, all good? That's all good. Thank you, everyone, for turning right. on your Thank camera. you, everyone. And once again, thank you, Dr. A. Let's say goodbye to Dr. A. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Bye, Dr. A. Bye, Dr. A. Bye, Dr. A. Bye, Dr. A. Thank you. Okay, I'm signing off. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, so guys, that is all for Dr. A sessions. And now, without further ado, let's welcome our beloved Miss Reggie to deliver her talk. Okay, so I'll be making some introductions um, about Miss Reggie. So secondly, we have Miss, uh, Miss Raja Lakshmi with all of us actually call her Miss Reggie. And for information, I'm from Bachelor of Psychology and Miss Reggie is my program director and everybody's love her, all right? And then uh, Miss Reggie is a dedicated professional with over eight years of experience in the education industry. And um, her field of expertise includes positive psychology, educational psychology, and child psychology. So in, um, without further ado, we'll ask Miss Reggie to maybe have a briefly introduction of yourself. Hi, Miss Reggie. Hi, hi, Wei Wen. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, all of you can hear me clearly? Yes. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. That's great. That's yeah. great. Okay, so um, yeah, so like what um, uh, he said that I'm the program director for uh, Bachelors of Psychology, in fact, a new program director. Um, I was lecturing uh, for this program since SEM 2, it began. Psychology at Taylor's began in um, 2015, August, and I joined Taylor's in 2016. And since then I'm here and um, I think this is a wonderful place for teaching and learning as well, right? So today, um, I've been asked to speak about psychoeducation. So um, a little bit about my background. I am not a counselor. I am not a therapist, okay? but I am a, I would say an educational psychologist. Um, if you look in the field of psychology, it's very wide. Psychology itself means it's just the study of um, human beings uh, thinking process, um, emotional process and behavior, and you can learn about humans in so many different settings. So before this, you um, listen to Dr. Anasuya. Dr. Anasuya, she's, um, she's a counselor and she's an expert in, in, in therapy and so on and so forth. So my um, expertise would fall on educational psychology. And so today I'm gonna talk to you about psychoeducation and the importance of what is it, um, who needs it, and why it's very important to have psychoeducation. So that's basically going to be my um, talk for today. And um, it's pretty short, uh, the lecture part of it. So I'm also going to be opening um, the floor for questions later on. So please feel free to ask me a question in related to this, um, this area later on. Okay, so... Um, May I share my slides? Sure, Ms. Reggie. Um, yeah. All right. 
So guys, feel free to ask questions and I have already attached the link inside the chat box. You can ask anonymously or you can directly just type in the chat box. Miss Reggie will, yeah, will reply to that. Thank you. Yes. All right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. So psychoeducation. Um, before I define what is psychoeducation and um, I, I talk about it, any one of you want to just try and tell me what do you understand by this term, psychoeducation? Anyone? Anyone, guys? Uh, if you're chatting in the chat box, sorry, I'm not looking at the chat box. Um, yeah, we have people say, not sure. Not sure. Okay, that's great. So you're here, here to learn. Okay. Let me share with you um, a story. Okay, I have, uh, I have uh, a set of twins and they are three plus, right? And, and uh, at about one plus, almost two years old, they, they, you know, children start to have teeth. Okay, and when you have teeth, you have to keep clean and you have to brush your teeth and children hate to brush teeth. I don't know why. Okay, but no one, I mean, and children just don't like to brush their teeth and, and they pretend that they are brushing their teeth or they just eat the toothpaste. Okay, and, and you know, uh, um, you know, I, I have a helper in the house and the helper have tried to you know, teach them, like demonstrated to them, you know, so that observational learning, the how to brush the teeth, you know, they, the, the, you know, I've helped them to brush the teeth and, you know, give reinforcements, give them candy if they are, if they brush their teeth and, and they still find it like a very dreadful thing to do that they, they rather not brush their teeth, right? And then there was this game on, um, on, on the iPad, which um, I, I didn't intend to, but this, this I mean, I just wanted to download um, fun games like ABC games for them. And this game called Pet Doctor was there and the kids were playing and they were so interested in it. And, and this is the, if you can see my cursor, can you see my cursor? Right, so this this was the game called Pet Doctor, and and this this particular game is that this teeth of the animal will just show up, and there are a lot of germs in the mouth, and the job of the child is to take the brush and 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 kill all the germs, and 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 I saw that, and they were excitedly playing, and then the next time when they were supposed to brush their teeth, then I said, your teeth got germs, we need to kill those germs, and then they were like, okay, and then they. You know, they brush their teeth. And then and then um, in the night, you know, when they're going to sleep and they themselves are now asking me, mommy, my teeth got germs. I need to brush my teeth. Right? So now they, they are so enthusiastic to brush their teeth every time they eat. And, and you know, they, 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 they now find brushing is not so aggravating as it was before. And what is the change? What was the change between before playing the game and after playing the game? It's that now they understand if they don't brush their teeth, they're going to get these ugly looking germs in their teeth. So they were educated of the consequences of not doing the action that they are supposed to do. And when they are educated with the, with the consequences, and of course with children, it's you know the way you educate them is different. And now they do it. And, and they do it happily, you know, it's, it's no more a struggle and, and a war that happens in the bathroom in the morning and in the night. Right, so this is basically what um, th this is an example of what psychoeducation is all about. Psychoeducation is basically helping people who are in um, who are having um, psychological problems, explaining to them, educating them what is it that they are going through, and what is um, what what basically what is it they are going through, and what are the what's what's their diagnosis what's their treatment, how their treatment is going to take place, and how basically just learning about it. So back then, what doctors do I mean, medically or psychologically, when a client goes to them and, and seeks for treatment, they, they say, okay, do this, do this, do this. That's it. That's the communication between the doctor and the client. And the client just listen and do, right? But now the importance of knowing is 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 a given importance right when the client or the or the patient knows why this is happening to me what's causing this how can i reduce this what's my treatment actually doing to me that is going to improve my condition will actually elevate the whole healing process much faster 
So that's what um, psychoeducation is all about. Okay, so if you look at the um, definition here, psychoeducation is a dehumanistic approach to including your client in the development and treatment of their own psychological experiences, giving them awareness, giving them knowledge. Okay, psychoeducation increases, like, like I mentioned before, okay, psychoeducation um, increases self awareness and self efficacy. Okay, they start believing in their own ability. They're not as as bad as they think they are, okay? By providing clients with the tools to set goals for their treatment and overcome challenges as they progress through therapy. In fact, psychoeducation became a form of therapy on its own. You know, it's, it's, it's a therapeutic method. It started first um, for uh, patients or clients who have schizophrenia. So sometimes if you, um, if you, um, I'm not sure if Dr. A mentioned about schizophrenia before because I came in quite in the middle when she was explaining about anxiety. But um, schizophrenia is another disorder which um, a, a person who's having schizophrenia may find it very difficult to understand why or, or even having the awareness that they are behaving in a different way, that they're hearing voices or they're seeing things that other people are not seeing, that awareness and that realization is not there. So this psychoeducation actually first started with uh, clients who have uh, schizophrenia and it showed tremendous um, improvement in their treatment. And this started to become something very popular. Even um, we don't use the term psychoeducation, but now even if you go to um, the clinics, the doctors also will tell you why this is happening and what medicines they are giving you and what the medicines will do for you. And this is psychoeducation. All right. I would like to share this with you. This was said many, many years ago, and this holds a lot of truth. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world, okay? even your own personal world. Right? Education is knowing is actually very, very powerful. Right? So who needs psychoeducation? All right, of course, the client, the person who's experiencing um, the issue or the problem needs psychoeducation. But it's not just the person himself or herself needs psychoeducation. If the person has a partner, the partner also needs to be educated because the partner needs to know how to respond to, um, okay, let's say it's a husband and wife okay, or a boyfriend and a girlfriend. So if the boyfriend is having depression or the boyfriend is having anxiety or the boyfriend is having obsessive compulsive disorder, so they are not behaving in a normal way, right? So um, as a girlfriend, okay, you should also be aware, you should be knowledgeable to um, support your boyfriend who is having this issue, right? You do not want to be more of a problem for this person. So even partners... Okay, let's say if, this is, if it's a couple, the partner needs to know about it as well to be psychoeducated. The family members also need to be psychoeducated, right? Um, in fact, I would say everybody needs to be psychoeducated. No, especially teachers in school, um, um, kindergarten teachers. I think this is very important for kindergarten teachers to know or to identify children who are having learning disability or behavioral issues because you know sometimes teachers who do not have this knowledge would punish the children in in not an appropriate manner and that can create even more issues right when if teachers especially like kindergarten teachers or primary school teachers if they 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 know um, about i mean if they are knowledgeable about this they can identify these early symptoms and early interventions can be done for these children so you know their issues don't escalate and amplify you know, um, one of my um, um, colleague who is a clinical psychologist shared, with, uh, shared this with me very recently. So, you know, now COVID um, is happening, you know, all this, um, you know, everybody's staying at home, but kindergartens did open up for a while and then it closed up and then it opened up again. And then, um, so this was going on. So um, this child went to the, I mean, so this child is going to the kindergarten and in the kindergarten, the child has a circle because we want to follow SOP. You know, you, you don't want to be close. So how the teachers teach the students to maintain the distance is they have like a tape, a circle, and the children are strictly instructed to not go out of the circle. All right. So this child it, it was already feeling very anxious, like, you know, like, 
she wants to go out of the circle because children are very, you know, curious and and they 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 just you know want to explore and and, and they're very curious. So being confined in that circle created a lot of anxiousness in her. And the way the teacher um, reprimanded her for every time when she stepped out of the circle, the teacher said, "I'll beat you. If you go out of the circle, I'll beat you." Right. So the child was constantly hearing this, "I will beat you. I will beat you." Uh, by the teacher, of course, the teacher didn't beat because the, you know that that would be another issue. But just threatening the child, I'll beat you. Eventually, the child like had this phrase in her mind, and at home, the child started saying this to everyone. If no one listens to her, she will say, "I'll beat you. I'll beat you." Right. And then the parents was like, "Why this is happening?" And then they found out that that anxiousness that the child developed just sitting in that circle because of that kindergarten created this whole issue. So a non-existent issue got created because the the, of lack of knowledge or lack of awareness of the teacher, right? So psycho psychoeducation is um, is actually important for all, especially people who are dealing with um, you know with other people, you know, to know what's happening, to know if there is a change in behavior. Just very basic information of what is normal behavior and what is abnormal behavior. Knowing this distinction, right? Then you can seek for help. You know, if you can just identify. You know what is normal and what is abnormal behavior. So usually, what is learned in psychoeducation, these are some of the basic things that they learn. Compliance, um, there is compliance and adherence focus, uh, illness focus, basically talking about what this illness is all about, like knowing um, what possible symptoms um, you may have because you have this condition. Like, um, for example, in uh, earlier, um, Dr. Anasu was talking about panic attack. Right. So usually people with panic attack will eventually comorbid with another disorder called social phobia because they're so afraid that they may develop another panic attack if they go out. So they get very scared. They don't even want to go out. Right. They, they just want to be alone because they're scared that they may have another blowout of panic attack. So um, illness focus. So this the person will be educated on what the triggers could be. You know, um, it's okay to go out, you know, illness focus and treatment focus as, you know, what the treatment is. You can't expect going for treatment one time and then you are, you know, fully recovered, you know, treatment takes time. So knowledge about the treatment, rehabilitation focus. So these are the things usually that is um, um, learned in uh, psychoeducation. There are several models that uh, therapists and doctors use, um, these information models, skill training model, supportive model and comprehensive model is actually the combination of the first all the first three models that they use to teach right so this is basically um sorry so this is basically what is learned in psychoeducation so who gives um psychoeducation i forgot to put that slide in right is usually it's a therapist okay uh, or the doctor so they are the one who gives you um this education so there are two types uh, there are two ways how you can gain this education there is the active psychoeducation and the passive psychoeducation. Active is you go and see your therapist, you go and see your doctor, and then your doctor teaches you and the doctor gives you this knowledge, right? So that would be an active psychoeducation. Passive psychoeducation would be when the doctor gives you homework. The doctor says, okay, go and read about this or go and um, monitor yourself on this. So it's you are doing it by yourself without the presence of your doctor or your therapist. But it, the learning is guided by your doctor or your therapist. Now, I ask you a question. Can you engage in self-psychoeducation? Give me some answers, yes or no. I think no. <laughs> okay. Why not? Um, because sometimes we're not really um, realize what's the main questions of ourselves. Like we need a third party to mm -hmm. that, yeah, that perhaps she or he will be more clear about what is what are we experiencing and stuff. Because yeah, there's yeah, the all right. In. So the okay, so this is the answer in the chat box. Let me just yeah. open the chat. Nicole say, I think you probably could make yourself more aware. Mm. Right. Okay. So the answer to this question is not very direct. Okay. When you engage in self-psychoeducation, how much of self-education are you engaging yourself in? 
Are you going to open Google, type in, let's say, for example, you want to know about anxiety disorder. You type in anxiety disorder, you read, read the first two links and then done. I'm psychoeducated. Okay. If you're going to do that, no, that's very bad. Okay. You know, and especially where are you reading this, the, the information from, from? Okay, that's why, you know, your lecturers always will say, you know, get credible source when you're writing your assignments because who is giving you that information is very important, right? So self-education can be detrimental if you do not know how to seek for the correct information, right? If you don't spend enough time learning about it, just spending five minutes, 10 minutes reading about it does not give you that psychoeducation. Right? So, of course, you going and reading about it, researching about it, listening to experts talk about it, that's good. That's very good because you're creating an awareness for yourself. Okay? But doing it very superficially can become very dangerous. Like what was shared previously, people can, be, can start self-diagnosing themselves and then worse, engaging in self-treatments. You know, and, and that can be even more, you know, the consequences of, of that can be even worse, right? So, yes and no. Yes, only if you go deep, okay, you search for the credible source or you double check with your doctor, with a therapist, with an expert. You know, is this knowledge correct? Yeah, I'm reading about this. I'm, I'm reading this book. Is this correct? Right? Okay, so that's very important. And it's very important to note this point. Okay, when you seek for information, you have to seek for the right information. Okay. Oops, what happened? All right. So why um, having knowledge is very important? Why is this psychoeducation something very important? Number one, it is empowering. Okay. When you know something, that means you are in control of it. All right. So when you are in control of it, you, you, you don't need guidance. You can do it yourself. You know, how do you, you know, when someone is, um, okay, let me try to give you an example. Okay, let's say riding a bike, okay? When, when the first time when you're riding a bike, you don't have control over the bike, you need somebody to, you know, stand with you and hold or you wear that, or you have that, the wheels in the side to help you. But eventually when you can, you, when you can ride your bike by yourself and you're just riding it as fast as you can, you know, that feeling of, you know, accomplishment that you are in control of your bike, that is, you know, that's, that's wonderful. Gives you that control and it's very. Okay, guys, oh, yeah, due to some technical difficulties. Oh, okay, Miss Raj is here again. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I think some something happened. No, it's okay. Let me reshare my screen. Yeah, sure. Take your time. Okay, so uh, where did I got cut? Yeah, it's, yeah, basically, yeah. Awareness. Yeah. Right, okay. So, um, so when you have awareness, so it means that you know how are you now, you know why you are like this, and you know how you can proceed forward. Okay, And this awareness actually helps you to become mindful. Right? So I, I believe that, you know, um, this whole C, um, Calm um, a series is talking about mindful, and I think having knowledge actually can lead you to reach that point of being mindful. Okay, you become very anxious because you don't know. What is anxiousness actually? You are worried about something which is out of your control. But if you know, right, you have that awareness, then you are in control, you are empowered. You can be peace with yourself. You're not anxious anymore. So that's how important um, knowing is, educating yourself is, right? Okay, so just um, like to end the lecture part of it um, with a quote, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance, right? It is more scary and you should be scared of not knowing something. 
Right, so with this, um, I end the lecture part. So do you have any questions for me? Please feel free to ask me and then I will um, answer you. Um, guys, do you have any questions for Miss Reggie? If not, I will gonna read out all those uh, anonymous uh, questions in the okay. link with that. All right, so there's a people that asking, what is the main differences between um, education and psychoeducation? All right, education is just learning. Psychoeducation is a very specified form of learning, learning about the illnesses, learning about um, the symptoms, learning about the diagnosis, learning about the treatments, and even engaging in activities that enable you to understand um, a person's situation better, right? So that is psychoeducation. So like I mentioned before, this itself became a therapeutic method. So the name for this th therapeutic method is psychoeducation. Like for example, you have the um, CBT therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's a therapeutic method. And then you have like, you know, multiple uh, ways, a multiple therapeutic method like art therapy or music therapy. So there's a name for it. So the name of a therapy method that yourself is known as psychoeducation. So that's why we have the specific term psychoeducation. All right. Um, there's another question said asking, what about special needs? Try explaining and the consequences, but they still do it. When bad things happen, only they understand, but still do it sometimes. Okay, all right. So that's why you need the expert, the experts in the field to be the one who's doing the psychoeducation. So the expert will know to what extent the person who's receiving it can receive that information, right? Like for example, someone who is okay i'm not going to go to a, a special needs i'm talking about let's say um okay we can talk about special needs so, so let's say a child having learning learning disability the child cannot um, understand alphabets read um read words so you can't give a book and ask the child to read so so a therapist will know this is the limitation but i can use a different method to teach or to educate that child mm. Right. Okay. So let's say, for example, someone who is schizophrenic, a person who is schizophrenic, who is hallucinating, they are not in reality. Right. So how much you talk to them and you explain to them and tell them, they will not able to understand what you're talking or, or absorb what you're talking. So they need medication to come to, to come to reality. And then only when they're in reality, then you tell them, okay, so this is what happened to you. This is, you know, these are the, you know, you educate them then. So an expert, that the therapist, the doctor would know how to um, and understands the limitation of the person and then educate them accordingly. Right. So in this case, even the special needs, um, even the special needs, so the, the therapist will know if this way is not this way is not working, then they will try another way. All right. Um, I'm not sure if you if you watch this show on Netflix called is it the Amsterdam. Any one of you? No. Anyone in the audience? Lim said no. No also. Oh, okay. All right. Um, yesterday, I was just um, chatting with uh, some of my friends. And yeah, it's on Netflix. Um, I didn't watch it, but they watched it. And then they were asking, they were like, since you are in psychology, can you tell me what, what is this? So apparently... So this child has uh, the child is labeled as a psychopath, but I think based on the ex uh, based on the uh, explanation that my friends were telling me, I think the child has a, a personality antisocial personality disorder. So antisocial personality disorder are people with absolutely no remorse. They are very good at manipulating people. They have no empathy. So this child has this this disorder, and so the psychiatrist is trying to. Uh, deal with this child. So apparently the psychiatrist used a few methods and it wasn't working. And then, I mean, I mean, I think as the series progressed, the, the psychiatrist used more advanced methods to deal with this little child. So listening to that, I said, yeah, sometimes, you know, it's not very direct. I mean, they need to, you know, um, see what works and how to educate the person to out, come out of that situation. Yeah. All right. Um, um, Miss, I have a question. 
So do you think psychoeducation should be common and like open for publics? And especially like what you have mentioned, uh, so maybe the uh, kindergarten uh, teachers might need some basic training so it can be better for the children's uh, education. Yes, psychoeducation, I think, is very important for all. But it has to be given by an uh, expert. Okay, and the expert, uh, if it's an expert, then the expert know to what extent you, you can um, share, what are the information that you can share. Because you do not want to leave someone halfway hanging and then understanding it wrongly. You know, like um, a lot of, okay, so this one, usually psychology students have this um, symptom when they learn this module called abnormal psychology. And when they're learning about all the different types of disorder, and when they're looking at the symptom, they'll be like, oh my God, I think I'm depressed. Oh my God, I think I am having bipolar disorder. You know, because when you look at the symptoms, you know, and you feel like I, I have this, I, I have, I have, I've had this, you know, you, you have this feeling, but actually that's why the main thing is you need to know how to differentiate between what is normal and what is abnormal. So everyone may have gone through these symptoms, but it's not at an abnormal level. It's at a normal level because we all humans, we all have ups and downs. We go through so many different things in our life, you know? So, um, so the expert should be very clear in teaching about how to differentiate between normal and abnormal. So you, you don't want common people to go around and start diagnosing people. You don't want normal people to go around and start giving treatment to people. That's a big no-no. Only an expert can do that, right? So the, in, in, within the psychoeducation, this information has to be very clearly and very strongly emphasized. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, mm-hmm. If there's another question, um, when patient or clients have in-depth insight for their problems because of psycho educations, will these situations wasn't the case because of self-fulfilling prophecies? Right, okay. So this is also uh, another issue. So usually therapists don't like to label the, the, their clients or at least not tell the clients that um, you are having bipolar disorder, you are having um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. They don't give the name but they will say that, I think you have issue in this area. Let's try to deal with the issue in this way, right? So they try not to tell, maybe in their own personal notes, they write, okay, this client is having this problem, but they they may not tell the client directly that this is your problem in the fear of self-fulfilling prophecy. So yes, so that's why, that's why you need an expert to give the psychoeducation. Not everyone can give that psychoeducation, right? So we don't want them to, engage in that self-fulfilling prophecy. So an expert would know how to deliver that, that information and that knowledge in a proper way. All right, Miss. There's some cute questions asking Miss, like, I'm more interested about Miss Tweens. I think they're asking like, how Miss, as a um, psychologist or as a lecturer, how do you kind of like educate your tweens and your, your babies and stuff? You know, um, having knowledge, because I think this is more personal question. So having knowledge in psychology and knowing, you know, developmental psychology and all of this uh, sometimes scares me because I know what the consequences will be if this is not done or if this is done. So um, it's it's knowing and, and doing is completely different thing. So it's really fun and challenging at the same time to be doing as well and when I see them doing the things that I actually read in the book it's it's very interesting especially um, um, maybe I can share with you another uh, another um, example so when they were uh, learning how to toilet train because you know they usually as a child they are in diapers and then eventually they have to come out of the diapers and you know they have to go to the toilet themselves so we decided um, uh, me and my helper we decided okay it's time for us to remove the pampers and stop stop the pampers. So we were like bracing ourselves. Okay, there's going to be at least a week of peeing and pooping everywhere because they're not, <laughs> not in their diaper. So um, so I'm like full-time working. So which means from morning until um, evening, I'm like engaged with my work. And I probably, even though I'm in the house, so I probably just go down for lunch for a while or my, my going down to the children's situation is just for a while and come back. So I know that when you punish, you need, when you punish, you need to be very clear with the child what is being punished. 
right? And then I realized that, um, of course, they, they, they don't know how to go to the toilet yet. They, they will have a lot of accidents. So when my, my son, you know, when he accidentally pee or he pee and then he realized he peeing and then he get like scared, he just, you know, freeze there. And when I hear uh, my helper scolding him, like, no, you have to go to the toilet. And the words that she used, I, I know that, oh no, she's not using the right words. The, it's like she, she of course, doesn't have bad intentions. She, she's trying to, to teach him, you know, but she's saying that what you did is wrong. So the child will learn that peeing is wrong. So the next time when the child wants to pee, the child will hold. The child don't want to pee because I'm reprimanded for peeing. Right? So you so the, the scolding has to be, why did you pee here? This is not a place to pee. You need to pee in the toilet. So you're scolding because the peeing happened in the hall, in the living room, and not in the toilet. So the child will think that, okay, if I pee, I need to go to the toilet. If I pee here, it's something wrong. Right? So these kind of things, you know, and, and it worked. So when, 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 when I was there, and then I told him, this is wrong, you have to pee there. And it, it amazingly just took two to three days to train my, my son to go to the toilet you know so so it's like yeah so knowing it see knowing this information really speed up my process of toilet training my my kids yeah so uh, this is one example okay that's all for uh miss twins babies i'm sorry okay <laughs> all right let's <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Let's continue with the psychoeducation topics questions. Um, there's one question asking Miss that um, can you explain some psychoeducation activities done by maybe you, Miss, or like some common methods uh, will be done in psychoeducation? Okay. Some methods that they use are inventories. So usually they will ask um, the clients to do the inventories, and then they will interpret the inventory together with the client. This is an active form, um, an active psychoeducation. So it's like um, I'm discovering about myself and I'm understanding why I am like this. So this is um, one example of uh, psychoeducation, all right? Um, these are, this is one activity, um, observation, self-observation, like homeworks. You like the client um, um, ask, the, uh, the therapist ask the client, okay, um, why don't you write it down when, whenever you feel angry? Or whenever someone says this line to you, you know, it's like then that whenever someone, um, you know, like, like self-observation. So these are some activities to basically increase your awareness in the condition that you are having. All right. And there's one more question. Um, the psychoeducation compulsory to start during the childhood? If not, what will be the worst consequences be? In childhood, meaning, um, I, I don't get the question. Okay, could you repeat maybe the question? All right, um, the question is, does psychoeducation compulsory to start during the childhood? Yeah. Okay, because psychoeducation is related to, um, okay, when we look at the, the term psychoeducation itself, it's about talking about an illnesses or talking about a condition. So when the condition appears, Right, then educating um, the person and the people around the person should start as well. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. And then mm -hmm. there's another question. Um, does early intervention only applies to special needs? Okay. This is question. Early intervention. Early intervention meaning that early intervention means that you are not waiting for a condition to become full blown. But when you notice symptoms, you immediately start to give treatment, right? Um, some types of disorders, you can have early interventions because you can identify it uh, at an early stage. But some you may not identify it only until a later stage, okay? So examples of some, some, uh, in some things that you can identify in early stage is learning disabilities, okay? Or... or uh, disabilities which is very biological in nature so that would, would would start to emerge so those kind of things can have early interventions if you look at the um, diagnostic criteria when you look at the like um, so usually clinical psychologists will do diagnostic but when you just look at the there is a book called the dsm5 it's the diagnostic statistical 
the as a manual something yeah so basically it has um how um the standards that uh, if you fulfill this standard then you may have the disorder and you would see that in many of the um, disorders is like continuously showing the behavior for two months continuously showing a behavior for two weeks only then you can say that the person is having a problem because sometimes okay let's say um, something really bad happened to you or let's say you experience a loss you go into grief you know, extreme grief you don't want to eat you don't want to talk to anyone you just close yourself in a dark room and then you just cry and cry and cry and cry but you do that for three days does that mean you have depression you know it's no it's just that you are dealing you are expressing your emotion of the loss and then the fourth day the fifth day you're coming out of the room and you you are going back to normal normal behavior so you cannot say that just because one day the person did not eat did not sleep and and um uh, you know, was just continuously crying. This, but this is an early symptom of depression. We can't, we can't conclude like that. Okay. So some yes, some for some condition yes, you have early intervention. For some, um, not so soon. All right, um, Miss Pot. These two questions, I think it's um out of psychoeducation, but it's related to Miss um, field of expertise, and I think it should be directed to Miss because it will be insightful if we know this. Um, for your first question is. Um, because Malaysia do not have the board to get a license from, um, but only for counselor and clinical, will it be illegal to practice without a license for child psychology? So for child psychology, we'll actually go under clinical psychology. So actually, when you do clinical psychology, clinical psychology covers everyone. That means adults, young adults, children, everyone. So you will be under the uh, you will be under clinical psychology license. All right, and then another question is, can we practice as a child psychologist after graduated master's in child psychology in UCSI, or do we need to have a license to practice as one? You definitely need a license. So either from the counseling body or either from the clinical psychology body. So it's like, basically it's like driving a car. When you drive a car, of course you can drive a car. You have the knowledge of how to drive the car. But when the police stops you, if you don't have a license, then you are in trouble, right? So similarly, you may have the knowledge, but you need to have that license. So I would highly suggest to get the license, either counseling license or a clinical psychology license, if you want to practice in Malaysia. If you, let's say you want to practice in overseas, then you have to get your licensing from the um, uh, overseas body, right? It's very important to be licensed because the governing body will protect you as a therapist and also it is responsible to protect your client, right? So it's very important to be licensed. All right, thank you, Miss. I think that is all for the anonymous questions. So I want to pass it to the floor. Do you guys have any other questions related to um, psychology education and also maybe Miss field of expertise? Feel free to unmute now and just ask Miss whatever you want to ask. Or maybe about Miss Tween's babies. You know, <laughs> yeah. So guys, feel free to just unmute and just ask any questions. Do you have do you guys have questions? Guys, this is a... I see the chat box and then one of the questions here says does both the twins have telepathy? Oh yeah. They are un, uh, they are not identical twins, so which means they were in separate bags when they were born. So I would say that the only thing that is similar between both of them is their birth dates. They are two completely different people. Their behavior, their personality, completely different. But they do care for each other. Like when my brother comes and carries one of the twin and walks out of the house, the other one cries, said, you know, don't take my Anne, don't take my Anne. <laughs> you know, they, they, they do have that bond, but no, not telepathy. I don't think so. I don't see that. They, they fight between each other a lot. Yeah. All right, guys, any questions more for Miss Reggie? I think all, oh, okay. I do have further questions as I know some seniors of mine practice as a child side. All right, um, Lim, do you want to unmute your mic and just share your questions to us and Miss mm -hmm. Reggie as well? 
Um, I don't have question because I have a senior who practiced as a child psychologist, but then she does not have a license for that. So how does that apply? Because I know, because I also applied for like child psychology major, but then I do, I did ask like, um, do we need license as now? Because I, I do worry that like, if practice without the, a license, like what you say, that uh, it will, you know, like illegal and it's not like, it's not right to do so. Yes, it's definitely not right to do so. But, you know, as you know, a lot of people do drive car without license. So similarly, I think um, they are practicing without a license. It is, it, it is dangerous. The, I, I also know a lot of practitioners out there who have clinics who are popular, with, and, but they do not have license. And, the, and they say that, well, Malaysia doesn't have a licensing body, so where am I going to get my license? But I'm still going to practice, okay? But now that the clinical psychology, uh, I mean, they, they have a license there, do try to apply the allied, based on the allied, allied Health Act to get a license. Uh, secure yourself to be a, a, a practitioner, uh, to be a therapist. Okay, all right. Thank you, Miss. So when you say child, like, uh, when you say child therapist, is it like um, play therapist, art therapist, or legit looking at child disorder, disorders in children? What um, type of therapy does she does? What type she, of clients do, does she? She have? does more like she did like group therapy, um, or sometimes I like, uh, do consult parents also, and some of it maybe play therapy. Yeah. Something like that. Mm. Um, specific therapy, if she, let's say she's only doing um, play therapy. So for that, right, I know a lot of people where they go for training for play therapy and then they come and then they, they um, engage in play therapy, but they are, not, um, they are not equipped to diagnose. But they can identify if there's any issue. They can help uh, the children express if they have any issue. They are like the middle ground, you know, but they cannot diagnose because only a clinical psychologist can diagnose. They are trained and equipped with the uh, uh, treatment tools to diagnose whatever psychological issues the child have. And then um, probably they can recommend treatment plans, which um, maybe a play therapist can um, conduct. You get what I mean? Yes, yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, Miss. All right, um, is there anything else, guys? Time flies, oh my god, it's already six, and uh, feels like not enough. Oh, yeah, it's just five minutes to six. Yeah, time really flies. All right, um, since that, uh, don't have any questions already, so, um, before Miss Reggie session end, um, do you have any, um, Love last words that you want to convey to all of our participants today, Miss Reggie. Ah, um, I, I saw what you've uh, wrote in the chat box. You know, um, uh, licensing and certification is different, and yes, that is very true, right? Um, just because you have a master's degree in some uh, in child psychology doesn't give you the license to practice child psychology. You have to get a light. You have to go and register and, and get your license to practice child psychology. That's a very, very important point. So in terms of um, psychoeducation, in terms of the topic for today, I think um, educate, I mean, generally educating yourself is very, very important. If you see something and you don't know what's happening, go and read about it, go and learn about it because truly education is very powerful, right? And one thing is that, one very important thing is that make sure you get the education or you get the knowledge or the information from the correct source. Okay, as you know now, the internet is very vast. There's a lot of information available, all right? And this information can be given by credible people or non-credible people. Okay, non-credible people means that it's not like somebody just randomly writing. Somebody who has a little bit of information is writing a lot about something. And that also is very dangerous. And when someone else read about that, which is not very true, and then, you know, it, it just goes on and on um, uh, passing out the wrong information, okay? Um, I, I would just like to, uh, we have four more minutes. Let me just share with you. I'm also doing my, my PhD currently. 
I'm doing my PhD in homeschooling specifically. So when I was doing my um, literature review, if you're all students, I mean, you all are very familiar with uh, the term literature review. So I came across this statement that, um, so this person said, this person's name, uh, this author's name was very common in so many journals and everybody was writing, like, like quoting this person's um, sentences. And it was just this one sentences. So I wanted to know what, con in what context was this sentences stated? Um, if I'm not mistaken, the sentences was that um, homeschool children have better communication skills. Because there are some research that says that when you homeschool, um, your social skills might be not so good because you don't interact with people in the classroom. You don't do group work. You're just alone all the time. You may lack the social skills. So some people argue that. So not going into details. So when I actually was trying to find out who this person is and what in what context exactly this person was talking about, and I realized that the context the person said the statement was very different from the context that it's being used by so many other authors. And all these other authors just picked that one sentence. I doubt they actually went to the original source to read the whole article to understand what was the context of these sentences. And it was passed through many years. I see so many other new authors using the exact same um, quote, but in the wrong way not in the way that the original author had meant to be, right? And, and this, this, I always use this example uh, when I'm teaching about literature review because it shows that, you know, information even on, even academics, you know, can be fooled by this type of information, right? So it's very important to be educated, but it's also very important to get your, get the, your information from the correct source, okay? So with that, I think, um, yeah, so that would be my last words. All right. Thank you, Miss. But then there's a very, very last question. See, people don't okay. want to go. See, people don't want to miss. Okay, go ahead. Right. It's a very, very last question. Uh, it's like, okay, since sure. you talk about your children, I wonder whether you will be stressed when teaching them since you have the knowledge, but everything have two-faced good and bad. Will yeah. we be tired? Definitely. Like, you know, um, one of my biggest worry, okay, so it's like, okay, I, I sort of believe in homeschool. I, I feel I'm a better teacher than the teacher that is going to be teaching my child, you know. But I worry that my relationship with my child is different from a teacher's relationship with a child. No, my, my child may not take me too seriously, but we listen to the teacher because the teacher is a teacher and is a stranger. So yeah, so there are pros and cons. So what was your question again? Sorry? Yeah, basically, uh, he or she just assume will be stressed. <laughs> yeah, I would be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Right? All right. And, and when I see things that is not supposed to happen, I get anxious also. Like, no, this is not supposed to happen. <laughs> yeah, agree. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So, um, I think that is off from Miss Reggie, right? All right. Um. So, yeah. all right. Thank you, Ms. Raji, for the amazing speech and talk. Okay, so um, it is the time to mark an end for our event today. Um, first, of all, uh, first of all, once again, thank you, Ms. Raji, and uh, of course, Dr. A, um, for the wonderful talks and knowledge. Okay, um, we appreciate all the efforts and information that you guys uh, have given us. Um, besides, I would like to thank all the participants for attending our event today. Um, without you guys, we'll not be able to successfully carry out this event. So. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right. And then, once again, don't forget to check out Taylor's University Student Council Instagram and Facebook account for more information of our upcoming event and hit, up, hit us up if you have any inquiries or comments. All right. So that is all. And see you guys in the future and hope that we can see each other um, physically later on. Okay. Bye. And thank you, Miss Reggie. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're most you're most welcome. Bye bye. Bye guys. Thank bye, Mr. Bye, Mr. Bye, Thank you, bye guys. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you. Hope guys. you enjoy the sessions. Yes, keep calm, stay safe, stay hydrated. Bye guys. <laughs>